Look around. It doesn't take long to recognize the brokenness surrounding us. Division, hatred, fear, uncertainty. The pain we're witnessing is real, and the need for a savior is undeniable. It's this need which broke the heart of God and moved him to do the unimaginable. For God so loved the world, he sent his only son to change our eternity, to be the perfect sacrifice for us. Love on a cross, dying once for all, laid to rest in the darkness of a tomb. Today, as we face so many unknowns, may we remember the simple truth of Easter. The stone's been rolled away. The grave is empty. Jesus is alive. And love has risen. Kind of interesting, the angels had to say that to the women who went to the tomb that day, right? They, they went there looking for a dead body, and the angel's were like, well, what are you doing here? Right? He's not here. He has risen. And, and so I, as I look at the Easter accounts, whether it's the women or the disciples or whomever, I, I, I can't help but thinking to myself, they should have known, Right? They, they, they should have known that this was going to happen. I mean, Jesus was the king of the spoiler, right? I mean, how many times did he tell them what was going to happen? If, if you were, if you were with, hanging with Jesus, if you were one of the disciples, or if you were one of, part of the group that traveled with him, I mean, how many times would you have like, covered your ears and said, spoiler alert, spoiler alert, oh, Jesus, you just told us how it all ends. Like, no one wants to know how the book ends before they read it or the movie. And Jesus did on multiple occasions, three very distinct occasions that we identify as Jesus predicting his suffering, his death, and his resurrection. There's other allusions to it on top of that, but there's three very clear ones. First one, well, they're, they're all recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The first prediction Jesus makes is in Luke chapter 9, verse 22. He says, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. It doesn't have all the details there, but there are some details, right? Jesus' second prediction in the gospel, I believe it's in the gospel of Mark 9.31. This one, the second of the three, the second has the least detail, but it still has enough, right? The son of man, he says, is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days, again, that's specific, right? After three days, he will rise, and then the third prediction, Luke chapter 18, this one has the most details. He says, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. So not only was he giving them predictions with details, but now he's saying, oh yeah, and all the things that, that, that are in the Old Testament, what the prophets said, bring that in here too. So there's more detail, right? And, and he goes on to say, he will be delivered over to the Gentiles, they will mock him, insult, insult him, and spit on him, that's really specific, they will flog him and kill him. On the third day, he will rise again. It shouldn't have come as a surprise to them. Add in Monday, Thursday, the night before he died, right? In that upper room with his disciples, he predicted Jud or Judas's betrayal. He predicted Peter's denial three times before the roaster crewed twice. And he predicted that all the disciples would desert him, and it all happened. They should have known. They should have seen it coming. I mean, they, they should have known how this weekend was going to go, seen by literally bloody scene. And in fact, Jesus said to them in John chapter 14, verse 29, he said, I have told you now before it happens, so that it, when it does happen, you will believe. And yet, what did the women go to the empty tomb looking for? A dead body. They went back, 
told the women, we have seen the Lord. He's alive. They, they, they're like, yeah, right. No. There's no way it could be. It's nonsense. Peter, okay, he, he, he had some curiosity. He went to the tomb. He, he, he saw that it was empty. He saw the grave clothes. And then, as we just heard from Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, verse 12, he went away wondering to himself what, have, what had happened. They should have known. They should have believed. They should have been able to mark off the events in real time as they happened. Now, here's the thing. It's easy for us to look back and say, well, they should have known. They should have believed. I mean, hindsight, number one, is 2020, first of all. Secondly, it's so much easier to criticize the actions of other people. And so I have to say that this applies to me, too. There's plenty that God has revealed to us in his word about how life is going to go. And yet sometimes I'm surprised. Sometimes I'm stressed that God isn't going to work it out. Sometimes I, I, I question, I doubt, I wonder, get a little snarky. But God, we, I mean, we have God's word. They had the word of God straight from his mouth, plus what we now call the Old Testament. We have God's word too. We have the whole thing. Beginning to end, Genesis to Revelation, Old Testament, New Testament, and God tells us how life's going to go. He gives us a whole lot of details about how life is going to go. For example, um, John chapter 16, I like to think of that God gives us heads up, BT doves and FYIs, right? Heads up, by the ways, and for your information. So first of all, Jesus, John 16, 33, heads up, in this world you will have trouble, all right? Just, just so you know, this is going to happen. Acts 14, verse 22, by the way, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Matthew 24, Jesus says, okay, FYI, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. And, and we don't just have Bible passages. We just have our general observation of, of how life has gone since sin came into the world when Adam and Eve sinned, right away. So sin we're told about in Genesis chapter 3, first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 4, Adam and Eve have two sons that get into a conflict. Cain kills his brother Abel. And, I mean, the floodgates were already open, but then just the whole Bible, there's betrayal, there's tons of murder, there's adultery, there's deception, there's idolatry, there's just so much. I mean, we, we, we can just, by observation, know that, look at the, look at the life of Joseph in the Old Testament, if you're familiar. He got betrayed, sold into slavery by his brothers, falsely accused, everyone forgot about him, he sat there in prison for who knows how many years. I mean, talk of, yeah, life doesn't always go wonderfully. I mean, and Jesus said that. Jesus told us, he's like, life's not always going to be amazing. And it's not. As we heard in the video, there's brokenness. There's deception. Right? There's, there's fear. There's uncertainty. There's unknowns. There's, I mean, so much dysfunction, so much sorrow, so much stress, so much pain that is caused by sin. It's so easy. It's so easy. Maybe it is for me. It's so easy to forget the things that God has said, the things that he has told us in his word, just like those earliest, closest followers of Jesus did. It's easy to get so caught up in the emotions and, and just let them take over and overshadow the things that God has told us, just like those closest, earliest followers of Jesus. It's, it's easy to find ourselves deflated, defeated, feeling hopeless, just like those earliest followers of Jesus. You know what's awesome? One of the things that's awesome about this Easter account that, that I just want to highlight here today is just how the Lord deals with those followers who forgot, who got all wrapped up in their emotions, who ended up defeated, deflated, feeling hopeless. I, I, I love how the Lord deals with those same followers. Pulling in some other accounts from uh, other, other Easter accounts from other Gospels. First of all, Matthew chapter 28, verse 5. The angels speaking to the women. They say, do not be afraid. So 
instead of rebuking them, instead of saying, hey, ladies, you should have known. So instead of rebuking them, the, the angel takes just a nice, gentle approach. Don't be afraid. It's going to be okay. I promise. Angel goes on to say, verse 6, come and see where he lay. So instead of like take this being like annoyingly showing them, okay, here, look, here's the proof. No, the angel patiently walked them through the evidence, right? And then, they, what do the angels say? In well, Mark chapter 16, verse 7, the angel says to the women, go and tell the disciples and Peter, as if to say, we, we, we know that they're all a bunch of train wrecks right now. All of you are, quite honestly. They need to hear, the, they need some relief. They need to hear this good news. They, you, go tell them right away. This is huge. And especially Peter. Because he was dealing with the, the, he was licking his spiritual wounds from the whole denial situation. Moving on, right? Uh, Luke 24 in our text. He is not here. He has risen. Again, instead of giving them some horrible guilt trip, beating them down, just share the, the angel just shares the joy and the excitement of Easter. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners and be crucified, and on the third day, he, on the third day be raised again. Again, I love this approach. I love just that simple encouragement. And it's just a beautiful encouragement for all of us in life. Just to remember. Remember what God has said. Remember the things he's told you. With regard to, to the women and the disciples, remember those predictions that he made that have now played out in real time, just as he said they would. Which means that those just aren't predictions, those are promises. Promises of things that Jesus said, I'm going to do for you, for the world, in order to be the Savior that you need me to be. Oh, and, and they couldn't remember what Jesus said. They couldn't remember the promises he made without keeping in mind, whether consciously or subconsciously, the character of the one who said them. His power, his faithfulness, his patience, his gentleness, his kindness. He had it all under control. Everything was going exactly according to plan, and he was at work in all of it. It, 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 it's just a hard, I mean, think about it. When you have to repeat something or remind someone of something, sometimes we get frustrated. Sometimes we're like, geez, are you serious? I got to tell you again. We already talked about this. You should know this, whatever. That's not, that's not what God did, just the heartwarming way that God deals with his people, that he dealt with them here, that he deals with each and every one of us. Again, life, again, in, saw in the video, life, life has its challenges, and it's hard, and it's, it's heavy, it's exhausting sometimes, it's frustrating. I mean, ever since sin came into the world with Adam and Eve, the world was drastically, that's an understatement, just changed in, 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 the, in the biggest possible way. When Adam and Eve sinned, death was unleashed on humanity. Like this oppressive blanket that you just can't get over your head. Death has been the source, since that moment, it has been the source of so much sin and so much sorrow, and, and not just the fact that, it's, that it brings an end to life, but that it ruins every moment leading up to it. God here says, remember. Remember him. Remember the cross. Remember the empty tomb. Remember his promises. Remember the victory that Jesus has won for us. Remember what it means. What does it mean? Romans chapter 4, verse 25. Jesus was delivered over to death for our sins and raised to life for our justification on Good Friday. Jesus said, it is finished, right? He was delivered over to death for our sins. The payment of blood that was required, the payment of a life that was required, that work was finished. And Jesus said, it's done, it's finished. Easter Sunday, right? He was raised to life for our justification. Now the Father replies and says, it most certainly is finished. And Jesus' resurrection is proof 
that it is finished. To be justified, that word that where it says he was raised to life for our justification, that means we are declared not guilty, innocent, free of, and clear of all charges through faith in Christ. Jesus paid for the sins of the planet on Good Friday, and we are declared not guilty through his resurrection on Easter Sunday. What does it mean? John 14, verse 19, Jesus says, because I live, you also will live. We also heard early in the Corinthians reading uh, where it says death has lost its sting. Now, maybe that doesn't, maybe that confuses you like, well, what do you mean death has lost its sting? It's still there. It's still a part of life. It's, it's, it's how life ends. It ends in death. And that, that's true. Physical death is, has not gone away. And yet, it has lost its sting. In other words, yeah, th there's still a bite to death. And yet, it's lost its venom, we could say. It lost its eternally fatal venom through the resurrection, the life, death, and resurrection of our Savior Jesus. What does this mean? The resurrection means that Jesus is exactly who he claimed to be. He is the Son of God. It means that he keeps his promises. It means that he's faithful to his word. It means that he's got everything under control at all times. And he's always at work for your spiritual and eternal good. Remember that. Remember all of that. Just as when Adam and Eve sinned, death came into the world and nothing, and everything was changed, nothing would be the same ever. Well, then when Jesus rose from the dead, from the moment that happened, now this world was changed yet again in an even bigger way. Life was now unleashed on humanity. The, the, the oppressive burden of sin has been lifted. The, 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 the shackles of, of guilt that we as sinful human beings carry around, that, that, that has been removed. The, the penalty of death also, it's been removed. Remember that. Remember all of that. Remember God's goodness. Remember his faithfulness. Remember his promises. Remember his grace. And that most certainly has huge eternal implications. And quite honestly, that's the most important thing. No matter how life goes on this earth, if we can live with the peace and the, the hope, the, the, the guarantee of eternal life in heaven, we can get through life on this earth with God's help. Right? You look in the Bible again, there's plenty of people who had, who, who had it rough and they're in heaven now for eternity. So while that's the most important part, all of this also has implications for right here and right now. Remember who God is. Remember what he has said. Let's go back to those passages I shared in the beginning. John chapter 16, verse 33. Heads up, in this world you will have trouble, but, he goes on to say, take heart. I've overcome the world. Acts 14, 22, we must go through many hardships to go where? To enter the kingdom of God. Matthew 24, 12 and 13, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but... For those of you, by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, who stand firm to the end, you will be saved. The Lord promises to us in the book of, of, of Philippians, our citizenship is in heaven. And that is a place where it says in Revelation 21, there is no death or mourning or crying or pain. Again, remember who God is. Remember what he has accomplished. It has huge eternal implications and it also has right here, right now implications. And that is beautifully, beautifully captured both in Psalm 23. Psalm 23, it says, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. We can all say this, right? No matter if you have a, if you have a ton by earthly standards or very little by earthly standards, you, God, God is right there with you. He is your shepherd. You lack nothing. Number, verse 2, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. I mean, just, just take this psalm in, in contrast to what we saw at the beginning of the video, at the beginning of the service. Just, again, the brokenness and the, the, the deception and the hatred and the fear and the uncertainty. 
and then, and then go to this, right? Verse 4, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings every single day. Verse 6, surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Through Christ, through his life, his death, his resurrection. Remember that every single day. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, we thank you for sending your Son, our Savior, Jesus, into this world to be the Savior that we needed him to be. In life, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy, and it's, it's hard, and it's heavy, and it's frustrating, and it's exhausting, and sometimes it feels overwhelming. In those moments, it is easy to go down uh, the wrong path, to go down a path of negativity, to go down a path of, of frustration and maybe even anger and doubt towards you. In those moments, in those moments, remind us of, help us remember, we need to remember what you've said. Your promises, your truths, you will never leave us or forsake us. You are always at work in all things for our spiritual and eternal good. You are with us every step of the way. You are our good shepherd. Our cup overflows with so many blessings. No life isn't perfect, but we have this, this perspective of your presence and that, that you are always at work and everything that happens in our lives, you, you use for our good. And, and we have exactly what you want us to have, whether that's much or little by human standards. You have guided us through life and you have a future for us. You, you have plans for us, not to harm us, but to prosper us, to give us hope and a future. And for that, we thank and praise you. For the perfect life of Jesus, our Savior, his innocent death, his resurrection on, on, for, on Easter Sunday, so that we could be assured that even though we do go down those wrong paths and we sin against you, we know that our sins are forgiven. We know that we are at peace with you. You have reconciled that relationship and we are your children, your sons and daughters. We are heirs. We are heaven bound for eternal life. We praise and thank you for all these things as we pray together in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours.